Well, first, uh, thank everybody for coming here. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I really like that there's so many technicians here. I think that's really cool. My name's Clayton Watkins. Many of you know me. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've traveled and gone to your clinics because we set up a, a new clinic where I'm able to do some procedures that I couldn't do before uh, on a mobile basis. So what I'd like to do this morning is present something to you where you can sit back, pretend you have popcorn, you're in the movie theater, and uh, watch a movie. This is a fairly long presentation, but I think it'll be entertaining. And if you get bored, we've got sharks. <laughs> so you can look at them. If you like what you see, and the doctor you work for isn't here, we're recording this presentation. We'll post it on our website. That website is vetmedutah.com. And you'll be able to view the entire presentation, review it, show it to your clients, show it to your doctors that you work for. And what we're trying to do is get the word out of how things are changing. Things are changing. We don't practice the way we used to 10 years ago, 30 years ago, and it's nice that we don't practice the way we did 100 years ago. And so sit back and enjoy. We're going to talk about the lower urinary tract, and we're going to take a journey. I'd like to show you some things that you probably have never seen. So when you're working, you can see a dog, and you can feel its bladder. You can take an x-ray, and you can, you can see the bladder on an x-ray. Sometimes you have ultrasound available, so now you can see a little bit more. But now, with what I'm going to show you, you'll be able to know what it looks like <coughs> inside. So it's really cool. I found a few things that you, you might want to get a laugh over. Uh, iPod in the back, iPad, Dad, iPad, and Puppy, iPad. We're going to talk about urine. Also, sorry I peed on the floor and the couch and the cat. <laughs> so a bit, bit of an overview. The lower urinary tract consists of a vestibule, urethra, prostate. UVJ stands for uh, ureterovesicular junction and bladder. There'll be a lot of acronyms in this presentation, and I'll explain what they are. They're, they're such long words, they don't fit on the slide, so we're going to use a bunch of acronyms. So let's take a journey through the normal lower ur urinary tract. First of all, why do we want to even look at it? Uh, the picture here shows a dog in a stance. She's, he's trying to urinate, and he's obstructed. He cannot urinate. All he can produce is a few drops of bloody urine, and he is miserable. So here are the reasons that we want to take a look at the lower urinary tract. If there's been recurrent urinary tract infections, hematuria, dysuria, okay, hematuria is blood in the urine, dysuria is difficulty urinating, straining to urinate is strange urea, palachia urea is urinating frequently, trauma, vulvar discharge, stone cases, incontinence, and anything that's just ain't right on the, on the ultrasound exam. So what can we do? This video shows laser lithotripsy. So this is a calcium oxalate stone. I think it looks like a piece of coral in the bladder. And the laser is breaking it into little fragments. So one of the things we can do is remove stones from the lower urinary tract, either with basketing or voiding urohydropulsion or laser lithotripsy. We can ablate ectopic ureters and move the openings back up into the bladder. We can remove polyps and masses, foreign bodies. We have removed foxtails from urethras. We can inject bulking agents for incontinence. We'll talk about that later. We can cauterize bleeding lesions and place stents. So starting at the bottom, the vestibule. There is a, a cavity just inside the vulva of a female dog. 
that looks like this. And in the vestibule, this is the orifice of the urethra and the vaginal canal. And so we're going to take our little journey of what normal is into the urethra. You should see these horizontal folds, smooth lining. The urethra of a dog is about five centimeters long and a cat is nine centimeters long. That's the junction between the bladder and urethra. This is the opening of the ureter into the bladder. It's called a UVJ or ureteral vesicular junction, so we re will refer to it as the UVJ. That's the right side. This is the left side. Now these are in the dorsal wall of the bladder. We scope all of our dogs lying on their back, so they're upside down. Notice how thin the bladder wall is. You can see the spleen through the bladder wall. It's smooth, has a normal vascularity pattern, and then freeze this. This case had a normal urinary tract, but, but three months earlier it had a transitional cell carcinoma. And we resected it, and this is the scar where that tumor was. Three months later, we don't see any evidence of tumor regrowth yet. So that's what normal looks like. So some things that are abnormal. VVS is the uh, vestibulo-vaginal stenosis. This is a congenital condition that's poorly understood and there's not a lot in the literature about it. I d actually don't even have an example. I've seen these cases, but I didn't. They're so old I don't have the video. But right here is the opening into the vaginal canal and this little ring here is called the cingulum. So some dogs are born with a stricture here where it's narrowed and this VVS can result in chronic vaginitis, urinary tract infections, and incontinence. This group of problems we often see combined together and they also are common in dogs with ectopic ureters. PPMR is a persistent paramesonephric remnant and it's a developmental abnormality and there's a continuum here where we start out with a little thin band and or a thicker band and even thicker and then a full wall. Uh, here is a red rubber tube and there's the other side and so this whole thing is a big wall of tissue that divides the vaginal canal into two canals. We can use laser or electrocautery to transect this septum and so why would we do that? This wall here can hold open the urethral orifice and allow organisms to more freely move up into the urinary tract and cause in, uh, infections. Lymphoid follicles are little aggregates of lymphocytes in the mucosa uh, of any mucous membrane that when there's chronic inflammation or chronic irritation, these follicles will form. So I'm going to show you an example of these lymphoid follicles throughout the urinary tract. This little dog has had recurrent urinary tract infections because she has a hooded vulva. There's so much skin draped over her vulva, it's completely closed. That holds organisms, organisms move into the urinary tract. These are the follicles. You can see them in the vestibule. This is the urethra and then right on into the bladder. Here are the UVJs. You can see the urine flowing into the bladder and then moving into the bladder. All of these little spots are the lymphoid follicles and they have what we call, call a fried egg appearance. The center is light, the margins red and they're commonly associated with urinary tract infections. When I see these, I know this dog's had or currently has a urinary tract infection. And then ectopic ureters. This little puppy has ectopic ureters. You can see the urine just continuously dripping. And right here is the opening of the ureter into the vestibule. You can see the PPMR here, vaginal canal on both sides. And see how this urethra is held wide open? That's because of this band here. And commonly these dogs will have urinary tract infections. So continuing our journey up into the urinary tract, we go into the urethra. And some examples of problems we will find are stones. So this dog has an obstructive calcium oxalate stone, can't urinate, 
And we use laser to break it into little fragments. Gone are the days when we needed to open the urethra to take stones out. Things are changing. We don't have to do that surgery anymore. We use a little stone grasper and pull the fragments out. Some of the fragments are flushed forward back up into the bladder and some out. But we can clear these urethras so that they can urinate freely. We're chasing the little stones and fragments back up into the bladder there. So the urethra is usually where our problems are with incontinence. Um, the urethra is what holds urine into the bla in the bladder. Now people have a urethral sphincterus right at the junction of the bladder and urethra. It's an actual band of smooth muscle. Dogs don't really have that. Their entire urethra is what holds urine in the bladder. It's called the urethral sphincter mechanism. So some of the things that we'll see, these are all related. Ectopic ureters, short urethral syndrome, a PPMR, or a, or a small bladder that's not developed. This dog has an ectopic ureter, and we're using laser here to ablate the tissue between the ureter opening and the lumen of the urethra and bladder, and we move that opening right up into the bladder to where it would be in a normal position. This is another case of ectopic ureters. You can see the opening here of the right ectopic ureter and the distal urethra, and then you can see the opening of the left ectopic ureter and the proximal urethra. I'm using a, a new technique to ablate these ureters now. This is a bipolar electrocautery probe. It's a hook electrode. And I like it better than the laser because there's no swelling and no bleeding, and it's super clean. About 95% of dogs with ectopic ureters have the form of a ureter where it tunnels under the mucosa. That's called an intramural ectopic ureter. And less than 5% have ureters that don't tunnel. They'll enter the urethra directly at a right angle without tunneling under the mucosa. Endoscopically, we can move these ureters up into the bladder if they're intramural. If they're extramural, they have to go to surgery and have their ureters transplanted. Clayton, how do you determine that preoperatively or pre-procedure? First of all, 95% are intramural. And so most of the time we don't have to figure that out. But here's what I do. When we see the opening and we place our guide wire up the opening in the ureter, you can actually push on it and see the guide wire lifting the mucosa. And sometimes the mucosa is so thin you can see through the mucosa and see the guide wire there. You can try and image them with CT, fluoroscopy, ultrasound. I think a combination of all three is useful. Um, what it really comes down to is when I start lasering the ureter, the distance between the lumen of the urethra and the lumen of the ureter gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we're cutting through thick, thick tissue, and then I start to sweat, and I start to feel a little sick, and I'm wondering when I'm gonna see some abdominal fat and cut right through. So if we cut through, this is magnified 10 times. It looks huge here, but it's not. It's a tiny little opening. So when I know that I've cut through, and this has happened, and this is from experience, and by the way, all of the cases that you see here, those are all our cases. We've seen, I didn't pull any, any videos from anybody else. Um, what we do with these, if they perforate, is place a Foley catheter for three to five days and it heals. And then if we couldn't move the opening of the ureter back into the bladder, uh, they have to go to surgery and have the ureter moved. So sometimes if, if they want to go to surgery right away, we just put a Foley catheter in the next day they go to surgery. And if it looks like there's an opening big enough to put a stitch on it. 
But that's what I do. It's, it's not easy telling if they're intramural or extramural with any of the imaging modalities because the, the ureter can lie right up against the neck of the urethra, right up against the bladder, and look like it's in the bladder wall. So it's a little tricky. Fortunately, 95% are intramural in there. We can treat them this way. So now you can see, uh, and I compare, as I'm doing this, I, I look at where my, my either normal ureter was or where I moved the, the ureter, and we just match them and line them up. And so we pull out our catheter. This is your ureteral catheter. And then you can see the new opening. And when they heal, they, uh, they look almost normal after they've healed. So this dog did become continent afterwards. So this urethral sphincter mechanism incontinence is something that's very common. I have a couple of examples here. Uh, since we're talking about ectopic ureters, if we repair these and move the ureter back into the bladder, there's only a 50% chance that they're going to be continent. And you go, wait a minute, doesn't make sense. We just put the ureter opening back into the bladder. They should be continent. Well, 50% of these dogs continue to dribble urine. So you should be asking why. And the reason is, is their urethra from day one was abnormal. It has to do with their whole urinary tract congenital defects. And they're unable to put enough pressure in their urethra to prevent dribbling. So this dog here is the one that you just saw the example of with the ectopic ureters. Young puppy. She became continent, but what if she didn't? What would we do next? We can treat medically with estrogen or proin or both. We start with proin. And 50% of those dogs that are still dribbling will become continent. So now we're up to a 75% continence rate. And we'll talk about later what we do with the 25% that are still dribbling. The old dog it's just an old female that just doesn't have the ability to contract her urethra, and she may respond to medical management also. So if they're not responding to the medical management, we can do a thing called urethral bulking. There's a new product that's been available for about three years now, made by Avalon Medical, and it is a bovine collagen product. The concept behind this procedure is that we place a needle just below the mucosa in the proximal urethra and inject this bulking agent. And that will create a, a bleb. And we put three or four of these in the same side all the way around the urethra. And what it does is it puts pressure on the lumen of the urethra so that the dogs can hold their urine. So this is what it looks like. We're injecting under the mucosa, and you'll see a bulge start to form here as we inject this material. We call them blebs. And we put three blebs in this dog's urethra in this area. You can see the, the contrast material here. And here's the third injection. Uh, also, we'll, we'll do three injections and then move down the urethra and do three more injections. And you can see one, two, three blebs, and the lumen of the urethra is narrowed now. This will last for about a year and a half. And the body resorbs it, and it has to be redone. This exact procedure is done in people. Found out that the human products aren't as effective as the veterinary product for us. So now getting to the dog. Let me pause that for a minute. Getting to the dog that has ectopic ureters and is the 25% that still dribbles, we can place what's called an artificial urethral sphincter. And this is an example of doing that. We can also use these in, in dogs that don't respond medically and the owners don't really want to do injections, bulking, and so we can place one of these sphincters to control incontinence. So we dissect out the proximal urethra and we place this collar around it. The collar is then sutured, 
You can see the single suture there. There's tubing connected to the collar. We run the tubing through the body wall, and this is a very similar procedure as is done in kidneys to place this um, a sub device. It's a, a device that diverts urine from an obstructed ureter. And so we connect the tubing to this port, which is placed on the body wall under the skin. That gives us access to the system and we're able later to inject saline in the port and down into the collar and it blows the collar up and puts pressure on the urethra. This is closed, open, closed, open. We're injecting and sucking the saline out to show you that we can put pr pressure on the urethra and that will help with the incontinence. Um, you can put so much in that they can't urinate or not enough and they continue dribbling, so you have to titrate it. It turns out that 40% of dogs that have this procedure done don't need any saline injected in the collar. Just the pressure of the collar alone is enough and they stop dribbling. And it's a lifelong therapy, unlike the bulking. So that's an artificial urethral sphincter. Anybody heard of that before? Is it brand new? I'm seeing heads going back and forth. Paul's the only one that knows about it. Okay. Other causes for incontinence are PUPD, that's urinating too much, too much volume of urine, and urinary tract infections. There's an uncommon condition of the urethra of dogs called proliferative urethritis. Fortunately, this is uncommon. This is a severe inflammatory reaction that occurs in the urethra, and here you can see these little strands of fibrin crossing the lumen. Some people think the stimulus for this inflammation is bacterial infection in the wall of the urethra. Sometimes this inflammation becomes so severe that the dogs can't urinate, they become obstructed. Sometimes we have to place a temporary stent to hold the urethra open while they're treated, and treatment is steroids and antibiotics. Urethral strictures. I want to show you an example of a cat that presented for incontinence, dribbling urine as if she had ectopic ureters. This is her urethra, and as we go up her urethra, you'll see the stricture here. But what are those? Those are the cat's ureters. So now the question is, is this an ectopic ureter cat? Who thinks it is? Must be a trick question. Where do the ureters open in a cat's urinary tract? Normally. They're not like dogs or people. The ureters actually open in the proximal urethra. That's normal for a cat. So now think about it. This is a congenital stricture. There's a stricture here right at the junction between the urethra and bladder. But because of the normal anatomy of a cat, you have the ureters opening up in the urethra, and actually this is dilated. So where's the urine gonna go? Down and out. The urine can't flow up into the bladder, so now you should be thinking, why isn't every single cat incontinent? Right? You thinking that? They're not incontinent because the urethra is so strong. The urethra measures about eight to nine centimeters long, and it's super strong. And so it's strong enough to hold urine in, and the urine flows into the bladder. That's what happens in cats. Did you know that? Good, we're showing you new stuff. This is cool. Question. Question, when you, if you do a PUPD, how does that affect uh, the placement of your overall, how does that affect uh, everything? What do you mean PUPD? I, uh, you know, you do the uh, male female. Uh, oh. Uh, so, so we're going to turn a, a boy cat into a girl cat because of stones. 
Um, still, the urethra is strong enough to hold urine back up into the bladder. I suppose if you moved the opening of the, the urethra into the mid-pelvis, they may not have enough sphincter mechanism to hold it in. But it is not affected, and they're not incontinent. Good. So let's, let's talk about what happened in this cat. So this is a stricture, and we're seeing the stricture right here. Positive contrast urethrogram with fluoroscopy. We place a guide wire through the stricture, and over the guide wire, we're going to run a balloon dilating catheter. And we're injecting contrast into the balloon. You can see where the stricture was. We continue injecting until the stricture is fully effaced and completely open. And so now we're going to show you what it looks like inside. This is where the stricture was. Here's the ureter openings right here. All of this healed beautifully, and the cat never dripped a drop since, so it fixed her. Does that recur? No. It's fairly rare, and I use this case just to show an example of urethral strictures. Um, we have a, a group of veterinarians across the world that do interventional procedures, and there's a society called the Veterinary Interventional Radiology and Interventional Endoscopy Society, and we can go online and post cases and ask questions. So I posted this case, and a few people respond and say, I've seen one or two of those in my whole career, and uh, we just balloon dilated it, and it was corrected. Other strictures we can do the same thing with. This is just an example of showing how it works. They don't, they, this one did not restricture. Some of them can if they're caused by other things, especially if the stricture is a longer tunnel. So where we had that proliferative urethritis case, that can be more difficult. We try not to leave stents in the urethra, um, and so with the proliferative urethritis, we'll place a temporary stent while everything heals. So next, the urethra can have cancer in it, and they can become obstructed. And so there's a couple of ways we can unobstruct their urethra so that they can urinate, and one is resection. I wanted to pause right here and um, show you how we all work together on this. You guys are the general practitioners. You technicians are on the ground floor uh, working with the patients. There's also the mobile ultrasound team, or you're doing your own in-house ultrasound, and that's fine. Uh, but we're trying to work together on this. So our mobile ultrasound team will go and they'll image a case and find something like this. So this is the bladder, this is the urethra, and the wall of the urethra, and you can see it better in real time, is thickened. The cause of this dog's obstruction was a tumor in the urethra. And so you can see how thick the urethra is right there. So have you ever wondered what it looks like inside? This is transitional cell carcinoma. All of this is tumor. And it's causing so much pressure on the urethra, this dog could not urinate. And there you open up into the bladder. We're using here a resectoscope. This is a bipolar resectoscope that creates heat and it cuts and cauterizes at the same time. So we were able to go in and resect the lumen, the tumor that had entered into the lumen and open it up so this dog could urinate. It's always nerve wracking when we do this because there's no dotted lines that tell you how deep you can cut the tumor away. I palpated a lot before we cut to get a feel for where the tumor is. Plus, we've done the ultrasound and kind of have an idea where the thickening is and how thick it is. But it is by feel. The loop will also cauterize bleeding vessels like you just saw. And then all of these chunks of tumor are flushed up into the bladder. This is what the urethra now looks like, a ton better. She is able to urinate freely. So then the, the question is, how long does that last? These tumors continue to grow and will regrow. We've had dogs be able to urinate longer than a year 
after having a resection like this, it buys us time. It allows us then to start the dog on chemotherapy or continue and do something like radiation therapy to try and manage their cancer. Well, sometimes we have a case like this where we have the same looking urethra. Now, this is a different dog and it's a different ultrasound. But the tumor isn't really growing so much into the lumen where I can resect it out. The tumor is just causing pressure from the outside in. So the lumen is really narrow. And in this case, we elected rather than resection to place a stent. Now, if you go to any specialty hospital or university, that is what's going to happen is they're always going to place a stent. So you can see the normal diameter of the, the urethra and the strictured area. We place a guide wire into the bladder and then over that guide wire we place our stent. And as we deploy this, you'll see it opening right here. Watch the contrast flow back up into the urethra as it opens. That holds permanently the urethra open and this is what it looks like. There's our stent in that strictured urethra. And she was able to urinate well. This also buys you time. You can then follow up with chemotherapy or radiation therapy or both. Question. Can you put catheter dorsal to that? There's another catheter? That other catheter is a marking catheter. It's a measuring catheter and it's in the rectum. Um, a lot of people measure, what we, what we do is we, ha we measure the normal diameter of the urethra, but it's magnified because of the distance from the, um, the x-ray beam to the patient and it becomes magnified. And if you need exact measurements, those markers are one centimeter markers. We have to do a little algebra. I had to refresh my memory on how to do that. And uh, you can adjust then for the magnification and get the exact diameter. We have to know the diameter and the length to choose the right size stent. So that's the purpose of the marking catheter. The difference between resection and a stent is the stents are twice as much as resection. They're very expensive. You have a foreign body in the urethra. It permanently holds the urethra open and so there's an incontinence rate of 25% full incontinence after you put a stent in. Owners have to be notified of that and willing to accept incontinence as a result. 50% of the dogs dribble a little bit and 25% don't dribble at all. Versus if you do a resection, they don't dribble ever. If you have a stent in there and there's infection, the stent can act as a foreign body and the bacteria can grow on that stent and form what's called a biofilm, which can be difficult to clear. So there's advantages and disadvantages of both. With the stent, it's very rare for the tumor to grow back in and it's usually good for life, the rest of the dog's life. What kills dogs and people with bladder cancer is metastasis. And there's nearly 100% metastatic rate. If you keep them alive long enough, they're going to die of the metastatic disease. And so these dogs aren't wearing these stents for 10 years. <laughs> they're, they, they have them for a year or two. Better than not being able to pee. Okay, let's move into the prostate. We have some benign conditions in the prostate, benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostatitis, and prostatic abscesses. We just recently saw an interesting case which illustrates here um, what I thought were prostatic abscesses, and this has been a confusing case. This is where we have to work with the lab to figure things out, but what I wanted to show you, these openings here are all the prostatic ducts that drain into the urethra at the level of the prostate. This dog had what I thought were abscesses and as we pressed on the prostate, we could squeeze this white, creamy, nasty out of the prostate into the lumen of the urethra. Kind of gross, isn't it? Like popping zits. I mean, whoa. 
Whoa. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We still don't know what disease this dog has. What? You sent us samples? It was like last week. Though. David, do you want to know the story? Maybe, maybe over lunch? You might not want to know the story. We've had so many different possibilities on this dog of what it has. Anything from transitional cell carcinoma, highly suspicious to prostatic carcinoma, which was definite on our last sample, to this is probably uh, epithelial dysplasia, secondary chronic inflammation. So it's a confusing case. To me, we, follow, we, we saw this dog back in July, and it looked the same, and expressed this creamy junk out of there. After we did that, and put it on antibiotics. It grew an E. coli, had a lot of resistances, got the right antibiotic, did great for three months, and then showed the signs again. Now the prostate, the same size, it looks exactly the same way it did three months ago. It squeezes out toothpaste like that. And after draining it, now the dog can pee well and acts normal again. But there were no neutrophils in our last sample that we submitted. So it's probably not an abscess. What is that creamy stuff? I don't know. It might just be necrotic tissue. But we've done true cut biopsies and multiple fine needle aspirates and we submitted the goo and still don't know what it is. So what it, what's happening though is that you saw the urethra, it looked normal. There's not tumor invading into the urethra and the prostate's not growing and getting bigger. So it's a confusing case. I didn't plan on spending that much time with this case. I'm eating up my time here. I want to show you a case of prostatic transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, you, you all know that the, the ducts, these prostatic ducts that we showed you, are lined with the same cells that are in the bladder and urethra and ureter and renal pelvis. They're all transitional epithelial cells. So the literature, and, and David could probably tell me if I'm right or not, probably 80% of prostatic tumors are transitional cell carcinomas, and 20% may be true prostatic carcinomas, but in my experience, it's almost 100% are trans transitional cell carcinomas. So here's an example of one. Here's the ultrasound showing this enlarged prostate, and, and inside the at the level of the prostate, we have adhesions, we have a narrowed lumen that doesn't expand with fluid, and we have a cavitation right here, an opening between these large fluid-filled cavitations that were in this dog's prostate and the urethral lumen. Now, I don't see in this dog a lot of tumor tissue that I can use the resectoscope to trim out. Yet, this dog couldn't urinate. Right here, we're doing a positive contrast urethrogram under fluoroscopy. There's a dilated ureter here. This is the prostate. And on a normal dog, you can push the contrast up the prostatic ducts into the prostate. That would be normal. But as you saw, this dog had a lot of cavitations, fluid-filled cavities in the prostate that communicated largely with big holes into the urethral lumen. So we've got contrast all inside the prostate, and I'm pushing and pushing, and I'm not getting any contrast to flow into the bladder. And this is what the dog's trying to pee against, and that's why he couldn't pee. And so now eventually, with enough pressure, I was able to get some contrast to flow through that strictured area. So we placed our guide wire, we placed our stent, we're deploying the stent here opening up that prostatic urethra. And it just holds everything open, and that's what the stent looks like. Unfortunately, this dog continued, it became incontinent. So that's the trade-off. So continuing our journey through the urinary tract, we come to the UVJ, ureteral vesicular junction. This is again where the ureter connects to the bladder and the urine dumps into the bladder. There are some specific 
disorders of the UVJ that have to do with ectopic ureters. Sometimes we'll ultrasound a dog and the ureters are huge and the renal pelvises are dilated. They have ectopic ureters, but in addition, they have strictures where the ureter opens into the urinary tract. So here's an example of a little dog that has ectopic ureters, but also has strictures. What happens is, because there's a stricture with this ectopic ureter, urine can't flow out of the ureter very well, and the ureter dilates and dilates and forms this big water balloon that we call a ureteral seal. This is a ureteral seal right here. It's a big fluid-filled balloon. Now you're going to be able to see, here's the ureteral seal. We're right at the junction between the urethra and bladder. And as we move in, we're going to identify the normal right UVJ right there. And you can hardly see it because of this big fluid-filled ureter. And there's the ectopic ureter and that strictured. We treat these the same way as any other ectopic ureter, so we're going to laser ablate the ureter opening, and now watch. We open up into this big fluid-filled cavity, and as we do that, everything deflates, the balloon is gone, back to normal. That's a ureter seal. I thought that was way cool. <laughs> Renal hematuria. How do you know where the blood's coming from? Is it coming from the lower urinary tract, or is it coming from the upper urinary tract? Here's an example of bleeding from a kidney into the bladder. Now we can tell now that this blood's coming from the left kidney, not the bladder. There's medical management for renal hematuria. First, though, I want to ultrasound the kidney and rule out a tumor. Sometimes they have a large tumor in their kidney, and that's why it's bleeding. But if the kidney looks normal, then why is it bleeding? It turns out that most of these, all of these dogs with what we call idiopathic renal hematuria have a tiny bleeding lesion in the renal pelvis. It's probably a hemangioma or an angioma, uh, a benign, tiny, tiny little bleeder in the renal pelvis. Some of these dogs will respond to Yunnan bio, which is a Chinese herb that improves clotting. And you can see doses there. They come in capsules. You have to go to a Chinese, uh, well, an Asian market will have them. And there's not really a dose, but there's a guideline here on how many capsules to give based on the size of the dog. And we also use ACE inhibitors, and some of these dogs then will stop bleeding. If they continue to bleed, there's a procedure called renal sclerotherapy. I don't have an example of that. It's pretty rare to have these cases. But what we do is we run a catheter up the ureter with a balloon on the end of it and seal off the catheter near the kidney. And then we inject a sclerosing agent into the renal pelvis. We use silver nitrate solution or povidine iodine or a combination. And what it does is it cauterizes that bleeding lesion within the renal pelvis and it's very effective. So we don't have to remove these kidneys. We can treat them. Now we move into the bladder and this is where all the excitement is. This is where all the action is. This is an example of a dog that has a hypoplastic bladder because it has ectopic ureters, a very short urethra, probably measured two and a half centimeters is all, and there's the ectopic ureter openings, and this bladder is really tiny. I point this out because when we repair the ectopic ureters, the bladder fills up with urine and it will grow and become normal again. I was concerned this dog would ever be continent because its urethra was so short. Short urethra syndrome. We went ahead and did the ectopic ureter ablation, and she became completely continent. I was surprised. Well, you can have ectopic ureters inside the bladder. There's the normal ureter, there's the ectopic ureter. But since it's still in the bladder, everything works fine, no consequence. We just leave those alone. We already saw the lymphoid follicles. This is an example of uh, idiopathic cystitis. This dog had had 
recurrent urinary tract infections, which is probably, maybe it's not idiopathic, probably the cause was the infections. But currently, there's no infection in this dog. And just to show what cystitis looks like, so if you've got a dog or cat that's urinating frequently, has urge incontinence and urgency to urinate, that's what their bladder could look like. Sometimes we see dogs that have a lot of hematuria and we do an ultrasound and there's a large mass effect in the bladder. And it can be difficult to tell the difference between a real tumor and a giant blood clot. Sometimes they're big blood clots and so we'll go in with a scope, visualize it, remove the blood clot, flush everything out and find something like this. I don't know if this was a hemangioma, angioma, or a benign polyp, but it's bleeding and there was an arterial pump going on. And so we can resect them, ablate them, and the bleeding stops. This is an example of a uracal diverticulum. You can see the diverticulum there. The uracus, little tube between the bladder and belly button never completely closes in these dogs. Some of these dogs have recurrent urinary tract infections, not all of them, they're usually young dogs. And so a few years ago we thought, well what if we ablated with laser the ectop or this uh, uracal diverticulum, what would happen? And so we just gave it a try. I ablate the superficial mucosa and inside the diverticulum with laser. We followed some of these dogs and repeated their cystoscopy and found that they healed over beautifully. There's the scar where that ectop, that uracal diverticulum was. And it turns out all these young dogs that have recurrent urinary tract infections, their infections have stopped. And we followed about a dozen of them. I don't know that this is real. There's a lot of debate on this, whether this is real. Uh, nevertheless, they've had these diverticuli, we've ablated them, and their infections have gone away. Polypoid cystitis, polyps in the bladder. Here's an example of a dog with stones, and because they um, have the stones, there's chronic inflammation, and that's what polyps look like in the bladder from stones. We can remove them with a polypectomy snare and electrocautery, and they don't bleed. I like to take them out because they can be a source of bleeding and also a cause for recurrent urinary tract infections. But then there's a condition that's idiopathic called polypoid cystitis. That's what it looks like after the polyps are resected. And this is probably the worst case I've ever seen. Huge polyp in the center with a necrotic tip, polyps everywhere, and after resecting them you can see what it looks like. The dog went on, and clinical signs went away and everything healed. We don't know what causes this polypoid cystitis. Sometimes we'll treat with steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And then we get to the tumors. I want to explain the difference between a transitional cell carcinoma that's on the surface and that, ha that has invaded the muscle wall. Let's go to the human condition. Bladder cancer is life-threatening. It will kill you. It's serious cancer, and I think the bladder cancer that we see in dogs is very similar to people, except we're catching these too late. So what happens in a person? The first time you see blood in your urine, is that okay? Or do you panic? You freak out and go, whoa, wait a minute, something's wrong. And so you go in to see your doctor, and they diagnose bladder cancer, but because it's early, it's just in the mucosal layer. Well, if you can ignore that and just keep peeing blood for six months, it's going to grow into the muscle layer of the bladder wall called muscle invasive bladder cancer. So what if you go into your doctor and you have muscle invasive bladder cancer? They're going to recommend that you have your bladder removed, all of it. Well, that's pretty aggressive. Why do they do that? Because it's very difficult to treat and control bladder cancer and it will kill you. This saves your life. It's a six hour procedure and you pee into a bag the rest of your life. That's serious disease. 
Well, it's the same in dogs. 80% of our dogs with bladder cancer have muscle invasive cancer. 20% or less we're able to find early. Now, I think it's really important that we do some ultrasound screening in older dogs, especially those dogs that are predisposed to bladder cancer. Because, and I'm going to show you why we can do something about this. If we find the bladder cancer early, we potentially can, can cure it. And that's what's done in people. If you have superficial bladder cancer, they're going to resect the tumor and repeat a cystoscopy every three months for a couple of years and resect any new tumor that comes and uh, treat your bladder with chemotherapy and stuff like that, immunotherapy. So we haven't been doing this at all in veterinary medicine. In fact, there's been this thought that maybe bladder cancer is different in dogs than it is in people, and I don't really believe that. There are studies that show that 100% nearly of the, all of the bladder cancer that they uh, sent to the lab was muscle invasive. Well, I think they're picking the cases that are muscle invasive because we get them too late. So let me show you why we would be interested in doing this. This is the poster child for bladder cancer, little Scotty. We found on ultrasound, and I want to pause this. This little pointer, this is the tumor. It's small. Oh, wow, that's bright. It's just in the mucosal layer. See that little dark line? That's the muscle part of this tumor. It doesn't appear on, with the ultrasound that it's invaded into the muscle part of the bladder wall. And when we get in with a scope, I'll show you what it looks like. This is the papillary form, and this is the sessile form of the superficial tumor. We can wiggle this tumor around and show that it's not connected to the tissue underneath. And we resect the tumor with a resectoscope, full thickness mucosa. This is my very first case, horrible technique. We don't do it like this anymore. But uh, not, nevertheless, we're able to resect the whole tumor. See the strands of muscle here? That's the full thickness. And then this creeping out tumor that's creeping out over the wall, we just ablated with this ball probe electrode. And so once we were done, we have this resection site. And then they let me come back and re-scope it. And you'll see the scar is right here. We rechecked it several times, and to this date, the tumor has not recurred. Cure? Probably. I've done two other cases where the owner let me rescope one year later, and there was no evidence of recurrence. Several other cases we've done uh, you've got in house ultrasound, the dog's not showing any signs, your ultrasound in house has been normal. Some of them will recur, but they generally don't recur at the resection site. They pop up with a new tumor someplace else. Well, what do we do if we have muscle invasive cancer? 80% of them, that's what you're going to see most of the time. Just to regress a little bit, how do we change this? We need to find these tumors earlier. So when you have a dog that comes in for hematuria and their white count's normal in their urine, you don't see bacteria, it's just been a knee-jerk reaction for us to think, oh, this old dog's got UTI. Let's put it on an antibiotic and send it home. Well, sometimes the bleeding stops on its own. And we think, oh, we're heroes. We, hit, we fixed it, and the owners are happy, and there's no more blood. Six months later, they bleed again, and it went from a superficial tumor to a muscle-invasive tumor, and we just sat on it and waited too long, and now we can't cure it. So. so Clayton, I'm going to take the opportunity to say something I was going to say later, which fits really nicely with this, is that the mobile side, we are offering, a, we're offering screening for these dogs. I know that a lot of you feel comfortable with bladder ultrasounds, and some of you don't, which is fine. But the urethral ones and the prostatic ones can be a little tricky. And so we've decided to offer some screening. It's 80 bucks, first Friday of every month. You just call Jillian, our scheduler. 
she'll, we can do it at the clinic, and we do a quick but thorough screening of any dog with unexplained hematuria. Get them fast. If they have two urine samples with blood in it, and you don't know why, or it's just not obvious, we need to get to them a little faster so that we can get these dogs to Clayton before they invade the muscle. So that's something we're starting that's new. If we're already in your clinic doing an ultrasound and you have patients that have hematuria, let us put a probe on them and see if we can catch these sooner. Additionally, there's a newer uh, diagnostic test called the BRAF test. BRAF is a, an oncogene. It is currently run by a laboratory called Sentinel Diagnostics. They exclusively license the test to Antec. So many of you, I'm sure, still use Antec. Won't hold it against you. Um, but uh, that test, uh, you can submit urine and they look for the one of the mutations in transitional cell carcinoma in sloughed epithelial cells. So you have a variety of modalities to try and investigate this that you should be thinking about and not just the old school May. Quick comment about that test. It's a very specific test. If you get a positive on a graph test, it's positive. If it's negative, the sensitivity is not quite where we want it yet. So it doesn't mean that if it's negative, it's negative. So ultrasound and then sometimes plus graph testing. If you get a positive, you can, you can proceed. If you have a negative, do not rule it out. The cost is about 200 from the lab. Um, I, I don't know. I, don't I, I think it's about 200 and then to the client it's going to be a $400 test. So the screening is much cheaper and I even if you have a positive test then the next question is, is where's the tumor, how big is it, what can we do with it, so we have to image it. So we're going to go to the ultrasound anyway. So you choose, you decide. Regardless, we need to find these earlier. We're kind of messing up on it. Because, and, and the question is, well, before you thought, well, so what? So what if we find it earlier? There's nothing we can do. That's true until we start using some of these techniques that are used in people, and maybe we have something that we can do. I presented this case at ACVIM last summer, and some people out of the University of uh, North Carolina that are developing some of this BRAF testing and, and so forth came to me afterwards and said, We've wondered about this. We've wondered if we could resect them. We always thought the bladder wall was too thin and we couldn't do it. And so they were all excited about it. They're going to go out and get their resectoscope. They're doing a lot of screening and they're going to start trying to do this. Basically, it gave them permission to go ahead and try and resect some of these tumors out of the bladder. It was really exciting. And, and you know, there's just, there's not very many dogs that have this early, that we're detecting early enough to do something about it. But for that dog and that owner, it makes all the difference. This little black dog that we just saw never went in to develop bladder cancer and it saved her life. We did this almost three years ago and it still hasn't come back. So this is a dog with muscle invasive bladder cancer. You can see the tumor in the bladder neck it extends down in the urethra. The whole length of this urethra was lined with, with TCC. It's superficial in the urethra, but it's muscle invasive in the bladder, and you can see these large clumps of tumor that are growing into the lumen. And I think she was really straining to urinate. I think some of these globs of tumor were flowing into the urethra, causing outflow blockage. It extended up into the bladder, and, and so now you know what bladder cancer looks like. We used a polypectomy snare and removed some of the bulkiness of the tumor, especially in the trigonal bladder neck area that could have been acting as a ball valve outflow blockage. Once they're, re they're resected, now the lumen is wide open there at the junction between the bladder and urethra. We could see the right UVJ, and you can see the margin of tumor here encroaching upon it but we could not see the left UVJ because of this big mass of tumor that was there. Fortunately, she wasn't obstructed yet. So now what I'd like to do is talk to you about what is done in people with muscle invasive bladder cancer. If you can't have your bladder removed, and there are people that say, no, you're not gonna take my bladder out, do your best doc, I don't care what happens. Or you have a 90-year-old grandma in congestive heart failure, is diabetic and has other cancer, and she can't have a six-hour 
abdominal surgery to remove her bladder. So then what do you do? In human medicine, excision of the tumor, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy are all used together. They can't cure bladder cancer in people, this muscle invasive. It's managed, and you live with it as long as you're going to live. So we can do the same thing in dogs. And here's an example of using all three treatment method, me methods in this one dog. We are doing some radiation therapy. I don't know if uh, all of you knew, we do some radiation therapy here in Salt Lake with the help of human radiation oncologists out of St. Mark's Hospital. There's two ways to get radiation into a tumor. Either external beam, which is projecting the radiation from the outside in, targeting the tumor, or you can go into the tumor with hollow catheters and through those hollow catheters place the source of radiation right inside the tumor. That's called high dose rate brachytherapy. Brachy means near, so we're treating inside or near the tumor with the source of radiation. That's the form of radiation therapy we have available here in Salt Lake, and we do this in our clinic. So I'm going to show you this case. Um, we have a specialized Foley catheter. It's a 30cc catheter that we put in the bladder, and then this hollow brachytherapy catheter is in the lumen of the Foley. We do a CT, and this is showing the um, planning part. So we, we have this computer program. Uh, this is our, our little area that we're going to put on the urethra there uh, to show our target. And it creates a 3D model, and then the computer system figures out how we're going to get the right dose of radiation to where we want it to go. And uh, this is really important here. Uh, this is the planning CT. You can see the bladder there and the urethra. And all these red dots are the catheter. And then this kind of orange margin, that is our therapeutic dose. The dose that we've chosen to kill the cancer. We treated this dog with three doses of 10 gray each. So gray is a measurement of how much radiation you're giving. 10 gray is a pretty good dose, a total of 30 gray. Um, you cannot do this with external beam radiation therapy. If you did external beam, all of these structures, the rectum, the colon, some loops of intestine, the whole pelvic canal is going to be exposed to radiation with possible side effects. This is extremely well controlled and very accurate. We don't have motion problems. The catheter moves with the bladder. The balloon in the bladder moves with the bladder, and you don't have to worry about it filling or emptying or flopping over to the side and missing your target. And so this has been quite effective in treating these urethral tumors. We've treated several of them and had really good success. This is a 3D model. There's the urethra, there's the bladder, and you can see the catheter. feel like you're in the future. Uh, here's the catheter. Those little dots are dwell positions where the source of radiation stops and emits the radiation. The source of radiation is housed in this robotic device called an afterloader. There's, it's attached to a cable that's attached to the catheter that goes up into the dog. There's a pulley system here that shoots the radiation source welded onto a wire into the patient. So we rechecked this dog six months later, and this is the urethra. And notice how smooth it is. This was completely lined with superficial cancer, and it's all gone away. It all backed away. And then even more striking is where that ureter you couldn't see before ended up. Remember, all that was full of cancer. We still have some tumor. Again, you can't cure this in people. Why would we think we can cure it in dogs, although we have a few cases we have cured? It was kind of superficial, uh, decided to resect some of it away to help it along. This is a ball a, a blader you can ablate superficial lining with. Just kind of demonstrate some techniques on bladder cancer management. Here is the right UVJ. We couldn't see the left before. There's the left. Look how smooth that is. I think it's amazing. So what we've done on this case 
is we've prevented obstruction of the urethra with the, the treatment. We've prevented obstruction of that left ureter. I think by now it would have overgrown. She'd have a, a balloon, water balloon for a kidney. And so um, I, think, I think it's helpful. She had chemotherapy, she had radiation therapy, and she had mechanical debridement of the tumor. So just to show what's possible, not all bladder tumors are transitional cell. And so recently we had this case, the ultrasound shows this big mass, looks like there's hair growing off of it there, and there was. We call this our uh, monster tumor. It was Halloween, and you can see the hair coming off of it. The ultrasound showed that the muscle was not thickened in the bladder wall, and manipulating it, we could see that it moved freely from the bladder wall. This is our resectoscope. It was so big we needed to trim it down so that our polypectomy snare could go around it. And so we have our snare around it. We decided to go for it. We looped it, pulled it up. See how it's tented up, pulling away from the muscular layer, and just whacked the sucker off. Bleeders can be controlled with this little ball probe. So now no bleeding. The big tumor is too big to pull out the urethra, so we had to cut it up into little pieces. And once it was trimmed down, we used a thing called an elec evacuator, which allows us to flush and lavage junk out of the bladder rapidly. They use this in people for taking bladder tumors and prostate tissue out. That's what we have left. That'll heal over beautifully and do well. This was a hemangiosarcoma. Came in for heavy hematuria. So now the bleeding stopped, but the question is, has it meted? And so now we're going to send it off to the medical oncologist for chemotherapy. Stones. The coolest, coolest thing. I'm going to talk about the two most common stones, struvite stones and calcium oxalate. We do see urates, we do see cysteine, but they're fairly rare, often genetic or a liver problem with those two. And then we're going to talk about how do we get these stones out in a minimally or non-invasive way. Again, things are changing. We don't have to cut open abdomens and bladders anymore. They don't do it in people. There's, a, there's been a trend over the last 30 years in human medicine. It is almost unheard of today to do open surgery in people. Everything's done laparoscopically, those abdominal surgical techniques. And even our, our uh, Paul and Dale and his Will here, way in the back, hey Will, uh, are doing arthroscopies and correcting some elbow problems. Will will talk about elbows. Uh, way more, he knows way more than I do about elbows, but uh, moving to these less invasive techniques is the trend. And so we're changing along with it. I wanted to point out, just for your consideration, there was an article in 2016 published by ACVIM. It's a consensus on how to manage bladder stones. And you'll see some names on here that you might recognize, Carl Osborne, um, Joe Barges, if you've been in any urinary lectures at Western States, he was there. Uh, Allison Brent, these are real leaders in, in uh, internal medicine. And I wanted to point out some things. Stones associated with clinical signs should be removed by minimally invasive procedures, just for your consideration. Stones too large to pass through the urethra should be removed by either medical dissolution, that would be the struvite, we'll talk about that, laser lithotripsy, or a procedure called a PCCL, percutaneous cystolithotomy, instead of cystotomy. That doesn't mean that you can't successfully remove stones with open surgery. You can, but you don't always get them all. Why would we? Why would they recommend that? Because minimally invasive procedures are associated with shorter hospitalization. We send them home as soon as they're awake and can stand. Outpatient, same day, we don't keep them overnight. Fewer side effects. 
We don't leave any stones behind because we can see so well. There are several studies that show with cystotomies, sur open surgery, that we leave 20%, maybe 30% of stones behind. Now, if you have a single large stone, you're going to get it, right? But if you have one to 200 stones, chasing those stones is a nightmare. Your surgery might be, might be two to three hours, and then you lose them down in the urethra and they become stuck and you traumatize the urethra trying to get them out and you finally send them over for us to put a scope in there and laser it out. It can be a nightmare on some of these uh, cases with so many stones. And then the owner who chose surgery over a minimally invasive procedure because it costs less ended up paying twice to have it done. So just for your consideration. So let's talk about struvite stones. All of these are struvite stones. Some of them are smooth and rounded. Some of them are crystalline. Some of them are coated with a biofilm of bacteria. Some of them look like gemstones, very crystalline. Most of them are round, and because they're soft and they rub against each other, they'll get flattened edges on them. Versus cats. Almost all cat struvite stones are sterile. Almost all dog struvite stones are caused by bacteria. So, anytime you have a struvite stone on a dog, the dog probably has a urinary tract infection with an organism that produces an enzyme called urease. And that enzyme breaks down urea and in the process changes the, the urine pH to an alkaline pH. So what are the organisms that are urease producers? I think the most common one we see is staph. Then proteus, Klebsiella, mycoplasma, and ureaplasma. These are the urease producers. E. coli is not on the list. Cats, they're all sterile and they're dietary related. So how do we diagnose struvite stones before we actually get a stone out and send it into the lab? We can get a feeling for whether it's struvite or calcium oxalate based on radiographs and the urine sample. Their pH will be high, they're positive for bacteria with a urease producing organism. Treatment is antibiotics and diet. How long does it take? Well, first of all, they need to be on an antibiotic the entire time they're treated and four weeks beyond complete dissolution of the stone. Small stones may take two to four weeks. Larger stones, four to 12 weeks. Kidney stones take months to get rid of. We use a stone dissolution diet and appropriate antibiotics. I always recommend get a culture. It costs a little more initially, but in the long run, you start out with the right antibiotic and you're not making a guess. If they become obstructed or severely dysuric because of the stones, then they should just be removed. We had a case come in for stone removal. We talked about struvites versus calcium oxalate. We looked at this history of the urine sample and what the stones looked like and thought these are probably struvite. And I always tell people, even if they're sent for stone removal, you can dissolve these stones, you know, because what's going to happen is we get a stone analysis back, they're struvite stones, the owner's going to go to Dr. Google and, deter and discover that we could have dissolved them, and then they're going to be pissed at me because I didn't tell them they could resolve it medically. So we had a case that uh, decided, okay, well, let's dissolve this medically. The, the husband said that. Wife said, I want them out. He won. The dog went home, obstructed that night, came in the next day, and we removed the stones. So you never know. Um, staph is most common, followed by Proteus and then Klebsiella, but what antibiotics work? So if we look at this chart, I think Clavamox is a good choice. It's going to kill Proteus and some Klebsiella and staph. 
if you don't have a, a MSRP, no, a, me, a, a methicillin resistant staph. So get the culture. That's going to tell you what's going to work. Um, the other one would be you could use tri trimethoprim sulfa, but there's possible side effects we all want to try and avoid. Uh, Batrol is another good choice, but it's not going to get every staff. Now again, this is where your culture is going to be helpful. So monitoring, keep checking urine samples frequently. You want to get a dilute urine, you want to have an acid urine, you don't want to see struvite crystals. And take x-rays. You should be seeing the stone becoming less radiopaque and smaller over time. Then you know it's working. If not, then the stones need to be removed. All of these are calcium oxalate stones and there's a huge variation in their appearance. Some of them are really pointed and jagged and sharp. There's our coral. They cause a lot of irritation to the bladder and then signs of cystitis. We call, I always call these metabolic stones. If you're a stone former, you're always going to be a stone former. We saw that and thought, what the heck is that? That was calcium oxalate. This is a mixture, struvite center, calcium oxalate outside. Now look at this stone. These are more or less round and have flattened margins. An x-ray would look exactly like a struvite. So the diagnosis before you have a stone analysis is kind of a guideline. This is variations. This is a calcium oxalate in a cat. That's a Cheeto. <laughs> we see these. That's actually in the bladder. That's a calcium oxalate stone. We call it our Cheeto stone. They're the most common. They're common in small dogs, males more than females. There can be some underlying conditions where increased calcium uh, promotes stone formation. And there's the list. The diagnosis is acid urine, no infection. If there's a secondary infection, it's probably E. coli. Again, it's not a urease producer. Beware of crystals. They can form in the urine after you pull the sample, especially if they sit in the refrigerator. Radiographs show jagged margins on classic stones, but they're not all classic. You have to remove these stones. There's no way to dissolve them. And there's different interventional ways to remove stones over a traditional cystotomy. And we're going to talk about what those look like. Now, uh, this, this is important here is what do we do to keep these stones from coming back? The ideas are to produce a dilute urine by feeding a canned food or maybe even putting water in their food and heating it up in the microwave so they're getting more water. We want their urine more dilute. We want their urine pH to be above 7. We, I, almost, I always put these dogs on potassium citrate at that dose between 50 and 100 milligrams per kilogram for life. And you have to adjust that dose based on what their urine pH is. So you need to be rechecking urine samples to see where their pH and, and increase the dose if it's uh, too low. If you run a test and to see how much calcium is being excreted in the urine, the thiazide diuretics can help with that. But even with all of this medical management, these stones can recur. And we hate to do this procedure over and over and over. Some people come to me and say, I've had these bladder stones removed three times, four times, five times. And they're so happy to hear that we don't have to cut their dog open anymore and we can go in and, and minimally or non-invasively remove the stones. But we shouldn't even have to do that. If we monitor and take x-rays every two to three months, we'll see the stones starting to recur when they're really tiny. And that brings us to how to remove these stones. And I want to show you a technique called urohydropulsion. Some of you have done this. Some of you, we've uh, explained how to do it over the phone. You've been successful in being able to flush stones out of the bladder without having to get into the bladder to get them. 
So here's an example of a cat with some bladder stones. They were small, you can see them right along here. And uh, I'm going to pause this and ask a question. Why don't we see bladder stones in people? Why aren't 20% of you walking around with a big honking bladder stone in your bladder? Dogs get bladder stones and we don't see them in people. Well, think about what happens. When a human urinates, their spine is vertical. And the bladder is sitting there and any stones that form fall into the urethra and you pee them out. And they don't grow because you keep peeing them out when they're small. Versus a dog or a cat, their spine is horizontal to gravity. Their bladder is hanging down into their abdomen. And when they urinate, the urine has to go against gravity uphill and out. And the stones stay in the bladder apex, where they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the concept between, uh, behind urohydropulsion. So if we can put our patient in a position like a human, we can actually express their bladder into a bowl, in a bowl and blow all these small stones out. That's urohydropulsion. They have to be fully anesthetized and completely relaxed. We have the technicians hold them up against their body, and then we express the bladder and it and expresses the urine into a bowl. You can do it with a male with a couple of cups that are placed together in a little hole cut out. And so you put the penis in the hole and do the same thing and they'll all flesh out. Um, afterwards, we ultrasound and show that all the stones are gone. April, did it work? Yes, it did. There you go. So if we have a recurring calcium oxalate stone former and you're taking x-rays every two to three months and you find little one millimeter diameter stones, how do you know if those stones are small enough? to be flushed out. In a male dog, if this, and it dep depends on the size of the dog too. So a large dog is easier, but most of these are small dogs. Less than three millimeters for a male dog, and you can see that, less than four in a cat, uh, in, a, in a female dog, and two and a half in a female cat. A male cat's not on here because you can't do that procedure in a male. So Clayton, in a male dog, it seems a little trickier gravity-wise. It works the same. They'll blow out. Yeah. It does seem more tricky. The smaller they are, the more successful you'll be. If you have one that's too big, it gets stuck, you just flush it back up into the bladder. If it gets stuck, we can help you out. That's where we may have to put a scope in. So laser lithotripsy in males and females, they're a little bit different. Just a few more case examples. So this little beagle had hundreds and hundreds of stones in her bladder. And these are struvite, but she was extremely dysuric, and the owners didn't want to wait for dissolution. So we place a catheter. Through the catheter, we put our a rigid scope, and we use laser to break the stones into little fragments. Most struvites don't break this easy. You know, we always show our best cases. Uh, struvites are soft, and some of them take a long time to break down. We end up with this uh, bed of gravel, use our elec evacuator, and rapidly flush out hundreds of stones in seconds. And then we're able to go back in and show and record that we haven't left anything behind, nice and clean. We will treat this dog now with one month more of appropriate antibiotic therapy and a stone diet. They don't have to stay on a diet forever. In fact, this dog probably doesn't even need a stone diet or any kind of urinary diet. If you control the infection, the stones won't come back. Keep checking urine samples and document their urinary tract sterile, and they won't grow back. We can do the same procedure in a male. Remember this guy, he could not pee, he was obstructed. So we go into the urethra with our scope and laser and we break out the stone. There were several of them here. These stones had become incorporated into the mucosa and could not be moved. 
After we break the stones up, remove the fragments and flush them all out, that's what the urethra looked like. It was pretty beat up. It'll all heal. Now we have to access the bladder. In a male dog, you have to make an incision somewhere. We're using ultrasound guidance to place a needle right in the urethra. It's the pelvic urethra that we're accessing just below the tail. We use a combination of ultrasound and endoscopy to visualize this placement. We put a guide wire through the needle into the bladder. And then over the guide wire, we use a serial dilating catheter starting at about six French, five French, and, and move up to whatever diameter catheter we're going to put in. So we haven't made an incision, we've just made a pinpoint prick and then, and then stretched it. So we have our catheter in through which we can place our scope and then visualize clearly everything in the bladder and do the same thing in a male dog that you could do in a female dog. This dog's stones were big and are small enough that they could all be flushed out. So all of that sand and all those tiny stones are going to be removed here. And you can see then that every last stone down to the crystals is gone. Same management afterwards. That's all we have is a tiny incision. I don't suture that. It heals rapidly and dogs don't look back and do well. Go home as soon as they're awake. Lastly is a procedure called a PCCL, percutaneous cystolithotomy. This is stone basketing. This little dog we chose to do the PCCL on because his stones were so big. This is the concept here of um, we're going to enter the bladder through a tiny incision in the ventral bladder wall or body wall. We pull the bladder apex up to the incision and hold it in place with some stay sutures. And then we place through a, just a, a tiny puncture and incision in the bladder apex this laparoscopic threaded cannula. Then we can put our scope in the cannula and visualize clearly what's going on and remove all the stones with a basket. If stones are down in the urethra, the part of the urethra proximal to the obstructing stone is dilated. We can run our scope down through the urethra, basket the stone, and pull it right out. So this is the actual procedure. We're threading our, our uh, laparoscopic cannula into the urinary bladder through which we place the scope. And this is what you see in the bladder. These larger stones will use a basket, grab them, and if they're small enough, they'll fit through the cannula. If not, we pull them through the bladder wall incision. It stretches around it, and the incision is still small. Smooth and kind of green. These are urate stones. So this dog, because of its breed, probably has something going on in his liver, and we need to check for a poor systemic shunt in this dog. The smaller stones we can basket with this basket that has a mesh at the bottom so it'll hold smaller stones. Uh, we continue the process until we're down to a bunch of tiny ones, and then we use suction and suction out the rest. So we're using suction here to pull all the rest of the stones out. So again, you can clearly see the, the bladder. You're not going to leave any stones behind. It's minimally invasive. We place two or three stitches in the bladder wall and then have about a, a somewhat, the incision in the body wall is just big enough that I can put my pinky through and feel the bladder apex. Again, they go home as soon as they're awake. They heal quickly. All we have is a teeny incision there and we haven't left anything behind. Um, the part where you saw the red rubber tube up the urethra, we can chase that all the way down the urethra and show that we've removed all the stones in the urethra. That's it. Sorry it's such a long lecture. Any questions? One of the things that you're probably wondering is how much does all this cost? Um, it's not the same price as if you did a cystotomy in your hospital where you have a, an investment of $500 in a surgery pack. This is several hundred thousand dollars of equipment to be able to do these, all of these procedures. And so we do have to charge more. People who have this done are glad to pay an extra $500 over 
the surgery because the outcomes are so good and they're, they're so less painful and, and go home and don't act sick at all. Any questions? So the cost. If you look in your packet, there's a, a services and fees document and it lists all the procedures that are available and their cost. So you can do that. Just, just briefly, um, thanks to my son Ryan, he's a videographer, has his own company. He edited 30 plus videos for this presentation, put it all together. I have no idea how to do this kind of stuff. He did it for me. We're filming it, it will be up on our website, vetmedutah.com, and you can watch it again or show it to your doctors at home. Thank you.